Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to A Night In With New Life, uh, the New Life IVF uh, webinar series uh, taking you through fertility treatment options, uh, including tonight we're going to be talking about PGT, which is pre-implantation genetic testing. It's uh, both a simple and complex world uh, of PGT. And uh, to make to simplify and make it really easy for you, we're very lucky uh, to have uh, two of the New Life uh, Fertility Specialists with us tonight, uh, Professor Martin Healy and Dr. Samir Jatkar. Um, we're coming to you uh, from East Melbourne, and uh, we're really pleased that starting Monday, our, uh, our uh, East Melbourne Service Centre is opening up to patients. What this means is that uh, we've got a nice little clinic close to the city where patients can have their uh, their there are IVF tracking ultrasounds, they can have uh, nurse appointments, they can have doctor's appointments, they can have blood tests, and that's all starting next week. So we're very pleased uh, to announce that that will be, uh, be starting up and hopefully we'll make uh, fertility treatments more convenient for our patients. Um, as always, during the, se uh, during the webinar tonight, we really, really, really love getting your questions and we'll get to those at the end of the, uh, the formal presentation. And if you would like to ask a question, you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, at the bottom of the Zoom screen, there's a little button that says Q&A. If you click on that and type your question, we promise to get to it at the end and, uh, and we'll answer it uh, for you and all of the other uh, uh, viewers. Uh, but without further ado, our first uh, talker tonight is uh, Professor Martin Healy. He is the, uh, the guru or the, uh, he's the doyen. He is the master of all things related to endometriosis and fertility. He's a great researcher and he is a wonderful uh, resource in talking about pre-implantation genetic testing. So he's going to talk first and uh, then he'll be followed by Samir. I'll be back at the end uh, with some closing remarks. Hope you enjoy the night. We'll do that. Hi, I'm Martin Healy. Uh, the introduction was so much better than the reality, but it's, it was, um, thank you very much, Chris, for all the nice things you did say about me. I'm just having, ah, uh, here we go. So, where, as Chris has said, if you have any questions, then if you can go to the little Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and use that, type in your questions and we will come to them at the end of the talk. That'd be brilliant. So let's start. You're gonna get a certain amount of repetition in what we say, and I don't apologize for that, but it means that as um, terms come up, you hopefully get two or three bites to realise what they are and what they mean. Starting off with talking about just doing genetic testing in IVF, it's worth saying we're all humans and we're made up of cells and our cells have a whole bunch of chromosomes in them and each of those chromosomes are made up of a whole bunch of DNA. And so when it comes to making babies, obviously, the, how the chromosomes and DNA work is going to become really important because that's the difference between whether you get something that's normal, feral, grows up to give you trouble later on in life or something that doesn't make it that far. Essentially, there's two basic groups of what we're going to be talking about. The first is testing where we're, what we're looking for is chromosome abnormalities. And this is goes by the term... PGTA or pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. The second is testing for things that are a lot more specific and we're usually using this where we already know there's a problem and we're trying to work out whether it's happening or not and so PGTM or um, testing for a single gene abnormality monogene and PGTSR where we're testing for a structural abnormality. It's worth doing a really quick sort of thought about history. 25 years ago or so, we were able to test the, and look at the number of chromosomes in a um, cell. Nowadays, we can basically test a person's whole genome in a few hours. And so we've gone from being able to 
sort of do a very, very rough test of are there the right number of chromosomes to now getting the really, really fine detail of what are the, what are the um, mut genes, are there specific mutations? And with this, the, the speed of being able to do it and the detail has gone up really, really by a huge proportion over this time. So nowadays, we, in a few hours, we can test your full genetic um, code. It took 13 years for them to do it the first time in the late 90s. Why is all of this important? Well, what we see, if we look at women as they get older, is two things that seem to be sort of basically piling up to cause trouble. The first is as a woman gets older, the number of eggs she gets reduces or the number of eggs she has reduces. The second is that as she gets older, the quality of the eggs or the proportion of eggs that are chromosomally normal goes down. And so you can see in this graph on the, on the um, slide that if you're young, you're 25, you've got about a 90 to 95% chance with 12 months of actively trying of falling pregnant. If you're 45, you're down to less than 10% chance of falling pregnant with 12 months of trying. So a woman's age is the most important thing that determines the, a couple's ability to fall pregnant. There are other things that can be very, very important. So this isn't the only important thing, but it's the most important thing that has the biggest impact on what we do as fertility specialists. Looking here at a nice little graph, what this graph is trying to show you is how likely you are to fall pregnant in one cycle of trying. So if you're in your early to mid twenties, you're looking at about a 25% chance of falling pregnant. If you're getting into your mid to late thirties, you're down to about a one in 10 chance from a one in four down to a one in 10. By the time you're 43, 44, you're down to about a one in 50 to a one in 100 chance of falling pregnant each time you try, so each month. So there's this decline in likelihood of you falling pregnant as time goes by and as you get older. On the other hand, as you get older, unfortunately, your likelihood of miscarrying goes up. So in your mid twenties, you're looking at a one in 10 chance. By your mid to late thirties, you're up to a one in um, four chance of miscarrying. And by the time you're 43, you're looking at over a one in two chance of miscarrying. And so even if you do get pregnant, the likelihood of that pregnancy going on to form a live baby that gives you grief is dropping dramatically. With IVF, we've got the advantage of being able to try and get multiple eggs out of a person at one time. And so this gives us a higher chance of achieving a pregnancy. But as you can see from the brown line in the graph, the actual sort of contour of the graph is the same, that as time goes by, the chance of success is dropping off. And again, by the time you're getting up to 43, 44, 45, you're looking at very low likelihood of achieving a pregnancy, even with IVF. However, the miscarriage rate, which you can see is the green line in the background, for IVF where we're not selecting out specific embryos, the miscarriage rate is exactly the same. And so we're still looking, even though we might get a slightly higher pregnancy rate through IVF, we're still looking at the same likelihood of miscarriage. However, if we test an embryo and screen out the embryos that are chromosomally abnormal and only put back normal, chromosomally normal embryos, then we're looking at a much higher miscarriage rate. Sorry, a much, sorry, that's totally wrong. A much higher pregnancy rate. We're up around the 50% plus pregnancy rate and our miscarriage rate is remaining low. It's remaining around the one in 10 rate. So logically you can see that there's an advantage potentially in giving you a better chance of getting pregnant and a lower chance of miscarrying by doing this sort of testing. So to recap, older eggs, more likely to be chromosomally abnormal, with that less likely to stick and grow and more chance to miscarry. And so the whole idea behind doing 
pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy or chromosomal abnormalities is to give you a better chance of implantation and a better chance of an ongoing pregnancy rate that makes a baby and therefore a lower chance of miscarriage. The other direction that we go, which I mentioned at the very beginning with this sort of genetic testing is to look for specifics. So there are a large number of genetic conditions that we know about in medicine. Probably the most common one is cystic fibrosis. And these conditions can be tested for. And this is what monogene testing or PGTM is about. It's about looking at people as adults and testing them to see if they're carriers of conditions like these or looking at embryos and testing embryos to see if they actually have the full-blown condition. So that is a very useful thing. Structural chromosome problems is the second thing that we talked about earlier. And here we're looking at situations where bits of the chromosomes have been rearranged. And this is associated with a, much, with a much higher risk of miscarriage in pregnancy for couples where one of the couple have such a rearrangement situation. So being able to pick this up is helpful but also being able to look at embryos and say, is this a normal embryo, can save a load of grief for couples who are looking at having recurrent miscarriages. There are large numbers of genetic abnormalities that are known about, and there are tests for a huge number of these. Most of these are really rare. So the most common genetic abnormality only occurs in one in 25 people. So this is cystic fibrosis in a carrier condition. However, there are many, many others. And uh, the three most common of these abnormalities are often tested for in couples wishing to start to try and get pregnant or in couples who are coming for IVF. However, you can test for up to 500 different conditions. And this can sometimes be a very useful thing to do, but it's not without its cost. We've got two basic ways of testing the embryo. So we can test parents or potential future parents, but we can also test the embryo itself. The first way is to actually take a piece of the embryo. That's called an embryo biopsy. And then take the cells from that piece, which is usually um, taken from what's going to become the placenta of the pregnancy, and go and do genetic testing on those cells. And this can be used for doing the PGA, PGTA testing, but it can also be used for doing specific tests for um, single gene mutations, the PGTM, or for the chromosome rearrangement, the PGTSR. The second way we've got of testing, which is quite new, is to actually get the fluid that the embryo is grown in and test that for fragments of DNA. And so far, this has only been able to be used for testing for the total chromosome count, the PGTA testing. So here we've got sort of a diagram of what goes on. So on the left-hand side, you see sperm and egg put together. In the middle, you see the embryo that's a result of that insemination starting to grow. And at around about day five, the scientists then take a little biopsy from the um, trophectoderm, which is what's going to become the placenta, and then send that off for testing. The advantages of embryo biopsy, we've been doing it for many years, so we've become quite good at it. We can reproduce the results. So in other words, what we say we, the results have shown can be proven, proven on repeat testing. There are a lot of trials showing that it's good and it can be used for all types of genetic testing that we're discussing. The difficulties with it, however, are it's invasive. So we're taking a piece of the embryo that requires skill and not everyone's got the same level of skill. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that embryos after a biopsy may be not quite as likely to implant as embryos that haven't been biopsied. But there's no evidence if the embryo biopsy is done at day five of increased abnormalities in the embryo. And so it's safe from that point of view. However, the scientists will 
select certain embryos and say this embryo is safe for biopsy, whereas others aren't. Looking at the non-invasive screening, here we're seeing on the top line an, embry an embryo being inseminated, fertilised and then started to grow in culture media. Once it's getting to day five or six, we take that culture media and test it for fragments of DNA that have come out of the embryo itself. There's a lot of very clever um, technology behind that testing, but so far the results are very promising. Now this hasn't been around for a long time, and so we're very dependent on small studies with small numbers of embryos that have undergone this. But so far, it's looking like it's almost as good as embryo biopsy from the point of view of its ability to discriminate between embryos that have got the right chromosome count and those that don't. Advantages, we're not doing anything to the embryo. We're not chopping a piece out of it. So that's an advantage. It's not dependent on a someone who's developed a particular skill. So the scientists don't have to have developed a lot of skill with it. It seems to be quite accurate. It seems to actually be a little bit better than an actual biopsy for working out whether or not an embryo is a mosaic. But I think we're going to have to wait for more studies to see whether this is definitely correct or not. We don't have to only do it on the really good quality embryos. We can do it on the sort of medium quality embryos when we're talking about grading of embryos by the scientists. However, there are disadvantages. We're limited to only doing it for the total chromosome count of an embryo. We don't know what the results mean as well as we do with the biopsy because we haven't had as many trials to help us define exactly what the results mean. And we're limited to doing it on embryos that have been inseminated using a process called ICSI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection. Because if we use embryos that have been inseminated by putting it in a droplet of sperm, there's a whole bunch of dead sperm potentially sticking to the outside of the embryo that can stuff up the results and mean that we get results that uh, are inaccurate and, and or nonsense. So I've come to the end of the part I'm talking about, so I'll hand over to Samir, who will uh, carry on from here and sort of fill in all the gaps I've created or lost or made. Thanks, Samir. Thanks, Martin. Um, so what I'll be doing is going into a little bit more detail about the individual types of testing, um, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. So, the first type of testing that I'm going to be talking about is the pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy. And aneuploidy is just a fancy way of saying the wrong number of chromosomes. So, uh, PGTA testing uh, looks for the numbers of chromosomes in a cell. And why is that relevant to IVF? Because most embryos that don't implant after an IVF embryo transfer, um, are, uh, the, the cause of that is a spontaneous new genetic abnormality. So not a genetic abnormality or chromosome number that they've um, uh, inherited from a parent, but that's happened usually uh, in the egg. So, Embryos with the wrong number of chromosomes often don't implant. Um, if they do implant, it's the most frequent cause of miscarriage in the first trimester. And there's a small subset of genetic problems that can uh, continue into a live birth, and the most important one of those being Down syndrome. Um, on the flip side, embryos that have the correct number of chromosomes are more likely to lead to a successful pregnancy, and that's the main reason for PGTA being performed uh, in IVF cycles as, as we perform them at the moment. Um, the, on the right of the screen, you can see a count of chromosomes, and um, we all have 46 chromosomes in total, 22 pairs of what we call autosomes, one through 22, um, and males have an X and a Y, and females have two X, so 46 in total. But uh, sometimes we call this 24 chromosome screening, referring to the 22 autosomes and the X and Y chromosome. In this one, we can see that there's three copies of um, chromosome 21, so trisomy 21, uh, which means that the cell that this, um, uh, that the, the, this particular test uh, arose from uh, was from an embryo person suffering from Down syndrome. 
Um, so, in the PGTA process, what we do is we exclude embryos from transfer that have those abnormal uh, chromosome counts. So, chromosome um, abnormal chromosome numbers can happen in essentially all of the uh, all of the chromosomes, and um, that count of chromosome again, for instance, in, in our little diagram here, is three copies of, of um, chromosome ten, and we wouldn't transfer an embryo that had, was suffering from that. What this means, if we are excluding the abnormal embryos, there's going to be less embryos uh, at the end of a testing cycle for transfer, but, the, but we're excluding the abnormal. So those that are suitable and we do transfer have a higher chance of pregnancy. It's important to know that PGTA is just a count of chromosomes. It doesn't um, look at individual genetic conditions. And again, example being cystic fibrosis. And the reason we keep talking about cystic fibrosis is that it is the commonest um, uh, a genetic or single gene issue in the Caucasian population at one in at least one in 25 people carry. Um, and it does not exclude those sorts of genetic problems. Um, and there is a turnaround time of two to three weeks for the results. So embryos have to be frozen. This little diagram looks at um, the proportion of embryos that are normal um, according to age and as well how many people at various ages will have at least one embryo available that is normal. The green line shows that once you're above the age of 35 or so um, you've got a greater chance of having an abnormal embryo. Any individual embryo has a greater chance of being abnormal than normal. And in some of the studies that have been all the largest studies looking at um, PGT, uh, they've found the, that there is a definite advantage for those who are 35 and above. And as you can see, if you're at 41, 42 with a 75% abnormal rate and uh, at 42, an 84% abnormality rate, that testing um, can make a huge difference by excluding the vast majority of embryos that are abnormal. The flip side to that is the blue line, which is that, well, if you're, if you're producing more abnormals and therefore the proportion of the embryos that we obtain are abnormal, the chance of getting an embryo for transfer, suitable for transfer, falls with age. Um, now, uh, that's disappointing for the proportion of people who have no embryos that are normal, but on the flip side, again, it's, uh, it's better than transferring abnormal embryos and being set back, for instance, uh, three months from a first trimester miscarriage. Um, interestingly, once you do have a normal embryo, uh, even in the older patients, uh, we have really high implant success rates. We quote a 50 to 60% pregnancy rate. Um, uh, and that testing can be done at any age, but clearly from these proportions, it does benefit older women more. So again, the advantages and disadvantages of, of the techniques. Um, so every time we transfer a normal embryo, there's a higher chance of pregnancy and a much lower risk of miscarriage. Um, patients who have had um, lots of IVF cycles sometimes ask for uh, transferring more than one embryo. We know that that's the biggest uh, cause of multiple pregnancy. And by allowing more single embryo transfer, we can make IVF safer in that circumstance. Um, patients who do have testing will have less IVF transfer cycles and uh, potentially lower uh, uh, less time to achieve a pregnancy and um, also potentially a reduced cost and that's because less cycles means less cost to the patient. What's the downside? Well, as Martin went through, it does require uh, a, a blastocyst full biopsy or alternatively, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, a blastocyst to actually achieve a biopsy or even the, the NICS. Um, non-invasive testing as well. Not everyone will, will achieve blastocysts um, that are that, well, embryos that make it to blastocyst. Um, if done improperly, biopsy may harm embryos. So uh, the first rule is do no harm. And if we have any doubts about the strength of an embryo, we would not test it um, and allow it to be transferred untested then risk uh, damaging an embryo. Once we do take cells from uh, a embryo, or once we take the spent culture meter, we need to amplify the DNA. And sometimes that amplification fails. So we can go to all of the effort of testing a, an embryo and still not have a result. And uh, we, those embryos are still available as what we call inconclusive, so available for transfer, but we can't give a definite uh, answer on whether they are normal or abnormal. And again, sometimes that's uh, disappointing. The final point is something that uh, we are recognising with the genetic testing that's of increased resolution, which is that of embryo mosaicism. 
Now, what's mosaicism? Well, mostly, and with the lower resolution genetic testing, we can classify embryos into euploid, normal um, number of chromosomes, and aneuploid, uh, which is abnormal. And very easily we say we can transfer the euploids and we would uh, not transfer the aneuploids. Um, with the high resolution genetic testing that we've been using in the last couple of years, we recognise that actually there's a number of embryos that are mosaic, that is, they contain some normal and also some abnormal cells. And the original thought that these um, embryos did not have a pregnancy potential was wrong. There is a chance that mosaic embryos uh, can result in normal pregnancy, but it is a lowered chance of, um, of pregnancy. And the decision making around what to do with these mosaic embryos and whether to transfer them is very complicated um, and requires proper genetic counselling. Generally, we say we would avoid transferring them if possible. Uh, we would prioritise euploid embryos over mosaics, and uh, that even includes potentially doing further stimulated cycles for testing uh, to try and get more uh, normal embryos. So it, it does throw a little bit more complexity into the decision to transfer an embryo or not. All right, now the next broad category is the PGT or testing for monogenetic conditions such as cystic fibrosis and also uh, PGT for the structural arrangements. Um, now, this is a little bit more complicated than the PGTA, so I apologise for that. Um, but the PGTM is particularly important because of what Martin mentioned, uh, which is that uh, the carrier screening now for cystic fibrosis, uh, SMA and Fragile X as a minimum is recommended for everyone contemplating pregnancy. And also with those extended panels of up to 500 recessive disorders, we will find that uh, uh, most people will carry up to four of those conditions. And once we know about them, of course, we would first step is doing partner testing to see if the pregnancy is at risk. But we are finding a lot more of these conditions in patients who don't have symptoms and wouldn't have symptoms for recessive conditions. And we're needing to do more of this monogenetic testing. So if you're in that first category of both carrying a recessive condition, this is the sort of testing for you, such as cystic fibrosis. There are other X-linked conditions such as descend muscular dystrophy. Um, sometimes patients come in suffering from a dominant condition, knowing that they themselves um, are affected by a disease and not wanting to pass that on to a child, uh, such as Huntington's disease. And we also see patients who have um, cancer genes. Now, because um, there's more and more recognition that some cancers that run in families are caused by particularly ge uh, particular gene mutations, um, you could be told an aunt or an uncle has been diagnosed with a cancer and they are a, a, a carrier of a mutation that you have inherited even though you don't have cancer at the moment and that leaves your children at risk of those cancers. And again, we can screen for that with the um, PGTM. The final one is something that I have encountered but it's fairly infrequent um, and that's HLA matching for a child who needs a bone marrow transplant and the ability to match subsequent siblings to be a donor. Um, the PGTM can be performed for any single gene disorder as long as we know what the specific mutation it is that that individual carries. Uh, but the creation of a test does require other family members to be available for testing. Um, and this is the process um, for um, developing the PGTM um, uh, testing. It's a little bit more complicated than the PGTA. Um, the first step being that we actually need to involve the genetic counsellor to discuss the genetic testing specifically. Um, we have to prepare a PGTM test just for that particular um, genetic abnormality. And that test is unique to a family. So that process adds a little bit of time uh, and effort uh, to, the, um, to the whole scenario. Um, but it also means that the accuracy of that test is high. We would then do IVF, and again, this one is requiring um, ICSI to create uh, blastocysts. PGTM does mandate having an embryo biopsy, so we very gently remove those cells, and that's sent uh, to the lab for testing. Due to the to the uh, time frames, uh, it must be a frozen embryo transfer to allow for the turnaround of the genetic testing. Um, this goes into a little bit more detail as to 
what is that testing that we do in PGTM? We don't actually have to test the individual gene in every embryo, but we try to work out whether the embryo has uh, inherited an abnormal chromosome from the mother or father, uh, which is a, a technique called linkage analysis, um, or sometimes called genetic fingerprinting, or carrier mapping. And what that means is it's a quicker way of analysing the embryos, but it's also highly accurate. Now, on to PGT for structural chromosome uh, rearrangements. Now, patients who suffer from chromosome rearrangements have all of their normal genetic material, but uh, it just exists in a different chromosome uh, shape or, or, or number than the usual instead of those 46. Um, and these could be inversions, uh, reciprocal translations and Roberts or Robertsonian translation, uh, translocations. And I will go into those um, into the, in, in the next couple of slides. What's the result of that? Well, the patient themselves is absolutely fine, uh, but we know that their gametes, so sperm or eggs, will have a uh, increasingly um, abnormal amount of uh, DNA in, in, in them. And what we'll find is about 80% of the uh, embryos or eggs will be abnormal. And that's associated with poorer implantation rates, lower pregnancy rates, and an increased risk of miscarriage. And often we know about these chromosomal arrangements because the patients come through and given a history of say three previous miscarriages, and that prompts their fertility specialist to run a carrier type test. Um, I, I must say, there's a tendency towards running karyotypes tests on all fertility patients, just knowing that there is a, a moderate number who come through carrying these. That's the explanation of their infertility. Um, to explain these in a little bit more detail, uh, and again, these technicalities um, are something that we worry about. Um, you, you don't really have to worry about these. This is for your fertility specialist to, um, to ruminate about. But just so that you understand the difference, a reciprocal translocation is where bits of genetic material uh, break off from one chromosome and another, and they, they swap across. So there's the still there's still 46 chromosomes. It's just that they um, the little bits of genetic material exist on different chromosomes than where we would expect. And as I mentioned, 80 percent of the embryos formed will be abnormal uh, and have um, lowered pregnancy potential. In the Robertsonian translocations, two chromosomes join together to form a large chromosome. And in that case, actually, the chromosome count is 45 instead of 46. It's commonly seen when 13 and 14 stick together and 14 and 21 stick together. Um, and due to the fact that uh, the chromosome 21 is associated with Down syndrome, there is a higher risk of Down syndrome in patients who carry these Robertsonian translocations. So the testing process um, involves a few different technical aspects or different technologies on the lab side. Um, and depending on the specific case, our genetic provider will determine uh, what sort of technique to use. The, the, the technique as opposed to PGTM is very similar to PGTA, but they, all patients must have the ICSI insemination. Um, but in contrast to the PGTM, you don't need the extra test preparation. Um, you don't need to have the fam or usually family members involved in the testing. And at the same time as you're testing for the structural rearrangements, you can do PGTA to maximise the pregnancy rates from embryos that are transferred. So getting close to the end of our presentation, the key points to take away are that these days, genetic testing can be performed fairly routinely. And we have a full service lab um, that, that uh, does this sort of uh, testing uh, every day. And um, the, uh, those who this is most suitable for, people who've had previous miscarriages, um, people who've had multiple IVF failures, and uh, patients who are a little bit older um, when they're coming to try for a pregnancy. Um, it definitely increases the rate of pregnancy per transfer and can lower the time to achieving a pregnancy by lowering the number of embryos that need to be transferred and hence the number of cycles. However, um, it does add to the cost of your initial IVF cycle for the testing. The flip side to that is though, you will have less embryo transfer cycles. So that actually makes it more economical by reducing the 
overall number of cycles. Uh, you can't test and have a fresh embryo transfer. And so because we have to have a frozen embryo transfer and there's the two to three weeks turnaround for the genetic testing, there can there is a delay um, to uh, achieving that first transfer. So if some people, if they're not aware of that, um, may just find that delay, uh, it's an extra month of having to wait. Um, and testing is not always possible for all patients and all embryos. Um, and in particular, PGT-SR and PGT-M is a very complicated area. Um, we would always get patients to see our in-house genetic counsellors and if necessary, our clinical geneticist um, for a, a, a thorough discussion before moving on to using uh, those techniques. And I think that's all we have for our presentation. Now, I think we're gonna move on to some questions. What I might do um, is uh, move on to the questions we've got. Uh, now, so the first question we've got is, uh, do you recommend testing for the CF gene, the PREPARE um, uh, test before pregnancy and IVF? Um, and it is the college recommendation that everyone uh, contemplating pregnancy does consider having at least the triple test, the PREPARE um, prior to pregnancy. Uh, it's not that everyone must have it, but it's a good idea to do that because if it's if, if any abnormalities are detected um, before you achieve your pregnancy, we can do the PGTM testing in order to, uh, to reduce the chance of a child being affected by a condition. Um, whereas if you wait till you're already pregnant, for instance, the, the only way to find out is through um, invasive testing of the pregnancy, which is associated uh, with a risk of miscarriage. So yes, we do recommend it. What's the downside? It's not covered by Medicare. Um, so there is an out-of-pocket cost for that. Um, then I might answer one more and then hand over to Martin. So um, uh, a patient has six remaining frozen embryos and two sons uh, and uh, don't want to be able to do six embryo transfers to find the embryo that works. Should we test the six embryos um, or should, uh, to limit the number of transfers and the cost and risk of doing so? So there's a lot <laughs> to that question. Um, I think my answer would be, it very much depends on your age. And um, the reason is the is the um, that the embryos in or the pregnancy potential of the embryos that you've got uh, will depend on the age you were when you froze them. Um, so if you are above the age of 35, yes, absolutely, the testing uh, is an option because you've got a 50/50 chance or lower of those individual embryos from being normal. Um, now the slight more complicated thing is that usually we take cells from embryos before they're frozen for the testing. So the extra complication here is that if you've got a frozen embryo, you first have to thought, remove cells, and then refreeze them all on the same day, which is a stress to the embryo. So we would lose potentially up to 5% of embryos in that freeze thaw process. So it still means out of the six embryos, the vast majority would survive that freeze thaw process. It's not always technically um, uh, we're not always technically able to uh, remove cells from every embryo. Um, so you can thaw and have not all of them suitable for testing and they're refrozen as, uh, as un unknown embryos. Um, and uh, you can't use the NICS technique because there is no um, embryo, uh, the, the media, spent media uh, to do the analysis. So you, you are committed to doing that invasive biopsy. So the, there was a question, what is the rough price of the testing? Is any of it covered by Medicare? So the answer is no. I'm not aware of any private health insurances that cover the cost of PGT testing. So I think you'd want to read very carefully your, um, your insurance um, paperwork if you thought that, that, was, that, that, that they were covering it. The next question I've got... Uh, is if all embryos come back as abnormal, and this is the last possible cycle for the woman with her own eggs, is there any way she can decide to transfer them regardless, i.e. signing a waiver? I think the, this, this question's got two interesting aspects to it. The first is um, when we look at embryos, as um, Samir mentioned, we, we really have three results that we get. The first result is normal. 
and that's easy. So everyone's comfortable with putting back a, a normal embryo. The second and sort of middle ground is a mosaic where the embryo's got some normal cells but some abnormal cells. And then the third is one that is totally abnormal. And I think most people ethically would be very uncomfortable with putting back an embryo that is totally abnormal because the only outcomes that are going to provide the patient with are either not getting pregnant or getting pregnant and having miscarriage. It's not going to achieve the aim that that, that patient is after, which is to try and achieve a pregnancy. The mosaic embryos, however, are a bit tricky. So the general approach people are taking nowadays is if the majority of the cells are abnormal in a mosaic and a minority are normal, then most people are going to be, again, very uncomfortable with the idea of doing a transfer. If it's the other way around and the, the majority of the cells are normal and a minority are abnormal, then there's been a number of studies that suggest that you do sometimes get a normal baby out of a transfer like this. The likelihood of getting a normal baby is much lower. The likelihood of not implanting or getting miscarriage is higher, but it is something that is looked at as being a sort of a reasonable thing to contemplate and as a last, last ditch effort would be something that could be discussed with your IVF specialist. It's, it, I think it shows how uh, interesting a topic this is that we've got lots of questions. So um, the next question we've got is, can you do the testing on frozen embryos or only fresh? As I mentioned, yes, we can technically thaw and rebiopsy embryos, but there is that limitation of not all embryos surviving the process and not all embryos being able to give us a result. Um, the next question is, are day six and seven blasts more likely to be aneuploid than day fives? Um, the, particularly for day sevens, yes, um, we don't, uh, we don't uh, freeze or transfer day seven blastocysts at New Life. Um, between day five and six, there may be a small difference, um, but we consider day six embryos to be uh, essentially as good as day five, as long as they hit that milestone um, of achieving blastulation or becoming a blastocyst uh, on day six, then um, those, uh, those, those embryos are considered si very similar to day five. But day seven, definitely um, we don't do because of the risk of aneuploid. Um, now, the next question is, um, if you test chromosomes of the parents, is there still a need to do PGTA testing? And what's the difference between um, uh, testing the parents and testing the embryo. So um, the difference is that if the parent has, an, has a chromosomal abnormality, the vast majority of embryos are gonna uh, um, inherit that exact same problem uh, from a parent. So it will increase quite significantly the number of embryos that are abnormal regardless of age. So you might be in your early 20s and where we would think the vast majority of your embryos would be normal, and actually the vast majority of your embryos are abnormal. The um, PGT testing or aneuploid is, is detecting something slightly different in that we as a species are actually um, really bad, even with normal chromosomes in the parents of producing uh, eggs specifically that have the normal number of chromosomes, because remember, eggs and sperm have to halve their number of chromosomes so that when they meet um, in the child, you've got the normal number of chromosomes. And that pro process of reducing the number of chromosomes in the egg um, is pretty imperfect in human beings. So parents can have normal chromosomes and embryos are abnormal. So that's what we're mainly directing PGTA testing at, which is spontaneous chromosome aneuploidy. And that's a universal phenomenon amongst human beings. And that is the part that is age related. And um, some of those stats that I put up before are that at least half, if not up to 70, up to 70% in the 40s of embryos have these spontaneous chromosome problems. And so that's what we detect in PGTA. So the next question is for normal tested embryos, what are the reasons for it not working? And so I, I assume what the person is trying to ask is, why don't all normal embryos make a normal baby? 
And that's got uh, sort of a lot of possible answers to it, but it really comes down to a few things. The first thing is PGA testing is testing for the total number of chromosomes. Have you got the right number of chromosomes? It doesn't tell us anything about whether or not you've got a, a single genetic mutation. And there are several ge genetic mutations that can lead to abnormal babies and lead to miscarriage. And so the, they're not going to be picked up on the, um, the PGTA testing. The second thing is you can have a normal embryo and put it into the uterus and it won't stick. So if the, the lining of the uterus isn't friendly or, or sort of suitable and it's not talking properly to the embryo and the embryo is trying to talk to it, then the embryo won't stick to the endometrium. The other thing that can happen is sort of bad things happen to people. People get sick. You can get a viral infection and get a temperature which can cause you to miscarry. There, there, there are a whole host of things. The, the shape of the uterus can be abnormal. So there are many things that can interfere and make it so that a normal embryo put into a patient just doesn't make a baby. And so getting a normal embryo is good, but it's not the whole story. The next question is, having six frozen embryoblastocysts, would all six need to be thought out to test them? Are they frozen as a group or individually? So the answer to that is if you're trying to specifically test frozen, frozen embryos, they are normally frozen as a single embryo. And so they can be thawed as a single embryo and tested. And, and I'm assuming you're then uh, looking at refreezing them. So... I hope that answers that question. The following question uh, is kind of a repeat. What are the fees for PGT? So I think we've covered that previously. So $695 per embryo with a cap of no more than 3950 if you've got lots of embryos. The next question is good but tricky but bad, and that is can I pick a boy embryo? And the answer is no. It's against the law in Australia to um, do sex selection in IVF with one exception. And that is if you, are, if you have a um, genetic mutation that you're carrying that means that any embryo you produce of a particular um, gender or sex is going to be abnormal that's usually life-threatening or quality of life threatening to a severe degree, then you are able to select on sex. But in actual fact, you're not selecting on sex, you're selecting on likelihood of a normal embryo. Uh, okay, so uh, what process or test do you recommend whether patients go through any PGT testing? Uh, well, that depends on what sort of PGT testing that we're talking about. Um, all the structural tests, um, I, I must say I'm fairly liberal in ordering carrier type tests on, um, on, on patients just because if you do do lots of IVF and you haven't done it um, and it doesn't work and then you do turn out, you do run it later on and they've had lots of cycles, um, it's, it's, I mean, you potentially have been somewhat futile. So I tend to run carrier types um, very frequently on patients, which would be the answer to whether you need uh, PGT-SR. If you need um, PGT-M, that's because you've got a, a condition that runs in the family that you know about, or you've had the screening that's recommended by the college, the asymptomatic carrier testing, and it's come back positive for both partners. Um, and the third, the third sort of broad, bu broad bucket of, of people who would have testing would be um, people who've suffered from um, uh, poor outcomes with IVF or recurrent miscarriage. And, and for them, uh, they, they would have the choice of PGT-A. Uh, um, and of course, the older patients who themselves take um, longer to fall pregnant or have a lower pregnancy rate in general. Okay. Um, now, uh, when the next question is, uh, when we get genetic testing for the embryos, do, can you do all of the tests or do you have to specifically request PGTM and PGTSR? So this is actually an excellent question. You would, um, you would have testing specifically for the reason or, or, or problem that we're trying to, to fix for PGTM or PGTSR. Um, PGTA can be combined with 
PGT MOSR. So if you have a single gene problem like cystic fibrosis and you're having testing anyway uh, for the single gene, we can in addition do PGTA, uh, but you would only ever do PGTM if there was a known problem that we were trying to prevent, and you'd only do PGTSR if there was a known problem we we're trying to pre uh, prevent, um, but PGTA can be done um, essentially for any patient coming through if when discussing the pros and cons of that testing with your specialist um, that they, you decide to do that. So, um, and as I mentioned when we were uh, talking in the presentation, if you are doing the PGTM or PGTSR, you will have really a detailed discussion with our uh, genetic counsellor um, uh, before undertaking those tests. We'll take you through all of the options and the pros and cons of the testing. Uh, the next question is, what is the rate of a successful pregnancy after transferring a PGT, a normal embryo? We quote between 50 and 60% for an ongoing pregnancy rate. You're probably around that 45 to 50% rate for a live birth. So it is um, much higher than the background rate for most uh, patients. And um, it is relatively independent of age. Um, once you achieve that normal embryo. I'd emphasize though, if you are older, the chance of getting a normal embryo is that, uh, is that lower, is, is lower, is lower. Um, the next one, which I might answer and then I'll hand back to Martin, is uh, my specialty, specialist informed me of the $700 genetic test available, um, which is, is it for PGTA? And I am 36 years old and have had two recent transfers. If you've had failed transfers, I presume that your specialist is recommending PGTA because that's the only uh, testing that's going to change the outcome for people who've had um, recent failed transfers. And the only caveat there is if you have had two transfers that um, haven't succeeded, I want to make sure that uh, both partners um, have had the carrier type testing uh, because if you haven't had the carrier type testing and you do carry a, 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 a hereditary chromosomal abnormality, you actually do need the PGTSR. So as long as you've got clear chromosomes, what you'd be looking at having is the uh, PGTA. The, the next question I've got is where do you do PGTA testing? And the, that I'm not sure exactly what where the, the question is coming from, but the answer is it's done in the laboratory. So after you've done, done your, um, your egg collection procedure and the eggs have been inseminated and grown in the laboratory for five days, the, the biopsy is performed there. Currently, we're doing our, um, the actual genetic testing itself um, off-site, but the, the actual collection of it is performed in the laboratory itself, and we use a company called Cooper Genomics for doing that testing, who have an uh, excellent reputation in this area. The next question is, do interracial parents have a higher chance of abnormal embryos? And th this is one of those questions that I'd have to say, I actually don't know. And the, it becomes very dependent on how you define race. But my understanding is that there isn't a difference, that, that you're looking at the same sorts of um, chances of miscarriage independent of sort of which racial group you've started, sort of your parents come from or you come from, that there's enough mixing and matching that's gone on in the, the world that what we consider one group, racial group, currently could very well have been four racial groups 100 years ago. So I think the answer to that is no, there isn't a higher chance of abnormal embryos. I would like to make one other sort of money type comment because a number of the questions have been about the costs of doing um, the PG, PGT testing. And that is to say that when we've been quoting the, the number $695 per embryo, that's specifically for doing PGTA testing. The cost of doing the PGTM testing, you have to do an initial feasibility study, and that's around about $1,800 is the, the number that I've been given for the feasibility study. And then on top of that, as you do the, the testing of the individual embryos, I would presume 
the cost per individual embryo is the $695 once they've got the, the test set up. But they've actually got to do the background work to get the specific test set up for that particular condition. I think that that's the end of the question. So I'll hand it over to Dr. Chris Russell to um, wrap up and thank you very much for your time. So thank you, Martin and Samir, for a great presentation. Uh, we really do love getting your questions and uh, I think uh, that was a really thought-provoking uh, presentation with, uh, with so many great questions uh, from our patients and our viewers. So thank you very much. We also got uh, a, a comment, a comment, not a question, which was just uh, one of our, uh, our uh, viewers, I think I call you, um, telling you, telling us how much you enjoyed it. And thank you. Well, it's absolutely our pleasure. As you can tell, uh, we're, we're very enthusiastic about our, our work and what we do. And, uh, and we love being here. Um, so if you do have any questions about PGT uh, at all, please don't hesitate to contact New Life IVF. If you've got questions about the fees, because they are a little complicated, as you can tell, but um, we, we do try to make them as straightforward as possible. We're, we're, we're most welcome to contact us in regards to that. And uh, just as an extension, we did advertise uh, when we were advertising the webinars that if you do attend a webinar and would like to see one of the specialists who presents, that uh, we're very, uh, we're, we'd be very happy to offer you a bulk build appointment to see either Samir, uh, Samir or Professor Martin, should you choose to, and they can go over all the details uh, about PGT to your particular circumstances, because as you can probably tell, everyone's circumstances are different and uh, which type of testing is, uh, is available to you and which is suitable to you and which will help you uh, is gonna be different for everyone. So we do encourage uh, you all to, to make appointments so that your uh, entire history can be taken into account. So thank you once again for, uh, for uh, tuning in. We will have uh, the webinar up on our YouTube channel in the coming days, together with all the previous webinars. Next week, uh, we have uh, another webinar planned. I think it'll be, uh, you're very lucky you get to hear me next week, together with uh, Dr. Nicole Hope. And we'll be talking about uh, freezing of eggs and storage of sperm and things like that, uh, which will, uh, will be uh, an interesting talk, I'm sure. And uh, we look forward to having you next week, uh, next Tuesday, in fact, at 6.30 p.m. Until then, uh, good evening and thank you for tuning in.